Let's get started then. I'm Richard Baker, president of the Pelican Island Audubon Society, and I hope you and your families are staying safe and able to handle these uh, difficult times. Be sure to vote. Uh, that's going to be an important issue for you, for all of us here. Despite the, the COVID hammering uh, us in, our, in person and we were working together, we had to be creative to continue our, many of our, our many programs. This is our first meeting that we've had with the public, so bear with us if it doesn't work out perfectly for you. The meeting is being recorded. We'd like, we're hoping that we'll be able to put this on our website. I was kind of trying to arrange this sort of like a, a, one of our regular meetings at the community center or up at the North County Library. Uh, one of the great things that happened to us uh, uh, this summer it was that we were able to halt the Sebastian land annex annexation and uh, it, it is holding uh, the judge uh, was the judges actually voted to uh, not allow it and then you know there's been a lot of uh, things happening up in Sebastian uh, they had another vote voted out three of the new commissioner uh, council persons and we don't know where it's all going to go. We hope that the city and the county will get together and work out a, a, a good deal. Uh, the Audubon uh, Advocates Program is going virtual. As you know, uh, the problem is what's happening with the kids in the schools. We decided that uh, it wasn't really safe for them to be picked up in our 15 passenger van and bringing them here. So we are taking our program to the schools. Uh, we will be offering classes at the Bureau Beach Citrus Indian River Academy and New One Pelican Island Elementary School, where we'll have a teacher, which will be uh, going through some of the same programs that we've had before. We are having our same scientists. We'll also be presenting uh, in a virtual session with the kids. And then we're asking them to go outside in their campus and explore it. So we're trying to give them as much an outdoor experience as possible. Uh, our students will be uh, starting uh, native gardens there and be looking after them. So we are going to be looking for a new, uh, new person to uh, take over her position for the uh, spring uh, semester. We aren't sure if it'll be virtual or, or if we'll be able to start the program again. It'll probably be virtual, but that's where we are on that. One of the nice things that Catherine Nix and Bob Montanaro have done is to provide some videos and they're available on our website. Uh, she, they have a great one on introducing people to native plants. Uh, there's one on the reddish egret, blue uh, heron, little blue heron, snow egret, eastern cottontail rabbit that hangs around our place. Um, we also uh, did a nice uh, one on the origins of the stick marsh, uh, the critical uh, wildlife habitat. And we've done a, a small one on the introduction to invasive uh, species. Um, these are the kids uh, under normal times. They, they'll still be able to use some cameras and things. But uh, if you feel like making a donation to support our after school program, we'd love to have, it, have you do it. Uh, we're under these stressful times. We're trying to give kids as much an opportunity to be outdoors as possible. Uh, they're, up until this summer, they've probably been inside watching uh, TV. Uh, it takes a cost of about four hundred dollars to support a, a fifth grader. So if you feel like making a donation, we'd love to have it to to try to continue this program in a modified way. The other big program that we have is the Trees for Life and Plants for Birds. Uh, you can get on our website take a test and register for a free tree right online. Uh, it's been pretty simple and it's been pretty successful. We've gotten some people, uh, a lot of people come and get our, our trees and our free plants. Uh, our, due to human development, we lost about 70% of our birds and the, and the birds are in real trouble. You, you might even be hearing lately of, of, of a big uh, bird kill in the southeastern part of the United States, southwestern part of the United States. Uh, the the pre trees are free you know, they beautify your yard, they provide shade and they improve air quality and provide critical habitat for our wildlife. Uh, so if you want to register, you can get one at our Audubon. Mary uh, helps us out with that and we appreciate that. 
all uh, uh, over 16,000 trees, uh, 1,600, excuse me, trees are uh, GPS and are mapped on our website. So you can see where our trees are planted. Uh, we have about, we had about nine species. We've got mostly live oak now. Uh, we have some mahogany and cypress coming along, uh, bald cypress, uh, but we have live oaks to give out right now. And we can expand out even from uh, Indian River County to our adjacent uh, areas, especially the areas around the lagoon. Um, our plants for birds, we've given out uh, over uh, 3,000, almost uh, 3,500 of about 30 species, and we have mapped uh, on our website where these plants are. So a total we've been, we've planted or given away uh, over 5,000 uh, trees and plants in this project. We did put it together, another uh, video uh, based on our book of uh, Blue Cypress Lake uh, using some of the photographs and, and talked a little bit about the history. It's a six minute uh, video. It's gotten over 500 uh, reviews or uh, people have watched it and uh, it, it it's gets it's getting a good uh, reception. We just recently put out a new uh, video on a birder's guide to migrations in India River County by Will Johnson and Julian Rudens. They did an outstanding job of putting this together. It's really new, but it's on our website. Here's kind of a copy of the way it will be. Uh, and one of the neat things about it is that it gives the hot spots for uh, viewing where the migratory birds are in Indian River, Brevard, and St. Lucie counties. So it tells you where you, when the, when the birds are migrating, where is the good best places to go to see these birds? So it's really got a lot of good educational value to you. We are looking for volunteers at our office. We need office help. Take care of our, our newsletter, fold stuff, edit. Uh, we have a lot of potato. We're gonna hear about it tonight, but we got a lot of air potato uh, and we're looking for people to help pull them down. Uh, right now they're sort of in their maximum capability moving this is one plant that grows about a foot a, a foot a day, seems like. Uh, we do have some uh, house maintenance. We'd love the classroom, bathroom, breezeways to look after. Our nursery trees for life project and replanting pots. We could use a lot of volunteers. If you'd like to lead a field trip, we'd love to have you. Fundraising and grant writing is also important. Publicity and trail maintenance. Working together, we can do great things for our environment. Um, Pelican uh, Nest uh, is our, the name of our store. Uh, you can visit it or see it on, the best way is to see it, the store items uh, online. You can come by, we like to have everything sold uh, online and then you can come by and pick it up. Uh, but we also have our two books that we've recently published, The Reflections of Blue Cypress Lake and The Florida Birds Exposed. And there are other things, t-shirts and other things there. Uh, you get clothing, books, uh, garden decor, home decor, kitchen items, and things like that. You can all see all that on our website. We also have a nice library online uh, with, where the titles and uh, authors are listed. And if you want to come down, and you can look on our website what books we have, and uh, you can uh, check them out and come down and, and pick them up. That brings us to the... Florida Birds Need Plants, a new uh, photo of the month program. And we're gonna have Edith explain this. So, uh, in the May, Edward McCool, who works in our gardens, was giving away these cypress trees. And you can see that Barbara Rebe, uh, planted this and so he was looking after the tree and he noticed that the green on the tree it was thriving but then one day he saw a shrike sitting in the tree and so he took a picture and I was thrilled that here was the shrike and you can see that it's a predator it sits on the branch and you can see the little curved bill 
And it's just like the hawk bill where they tear apart. And of course the shrike goes after insects. So he's up there on a tree needing a perch. So I got to, to the idea of birds really need these plants and wouldn't it be fun to morph our photo of the month into birds need plants. So that started the, the effort and then we had this beautiful owl and owl, this is a great horned owl and Barbara Sermon took this photo and you can see that it's in the midst of an, one of these old live oaks and owls just don't make their own nest. So they have to find places where they can kind of line it with lovely little soft plants like the Spanish moss you can see hanging around and in and, and part of the nest is lined. And then she found this nest and she was able to take this picture. And this is in the early weeks, the first seven days probably, that little white fluff ball you can see on the left is another little fluff ball. And you can see how the plants are used to camouflage their location. But what appealed to me in this picture is how affectionate mother owl looks towards her young. And they often wonder what she's thinking. I'm going to protect this owl. So that was our second photo of the month. And since we haven't had a meeting, I'm going to show you the next one too. And this is by Don Curry, who I think is in our audience. And uh, she, we're, we're allowing three photos now. So if you want to submit any photos, you could submit as many as you want, up to three, and have a plant and how the, the bird is using plants. And in this instance, you can see lots of grass. This is where the snails hide. And this is a snail kite. And it's a marvelous picture. You can see the claws and all details of this snail kite hovering over the grass, looking, looking, looking for snails. And here at the bottom right is her other picture showing that he clasped the snail in his claws. Aren't these marvelous pictures? You can see the, the leg bands on these snail kites. And these, they're getting the invasive snail. And in the newsletter, the, the Telegram magazine that we just published, I talk about how these snails are expanding across Florida and it's, they are, the snail kites are really going after them and evolution is taking place within a few years. The young are getting bigger in terms of their bill and in their claws and they're able to open up these um, snails. So send in your pictures. These are wonderful pictures. Thank you, Don. Hey, thank you, Nita, very much. Uh, that brings us to our speaker tonight. We're so lucky to have Dr. Terry Minter, Assistant Professor in Weed Biological Control Entomology and the Entomology and Nematology Department at the University of uh, Florida. She has her research station over in the next county down close to us. We appreciate that. Uh, she works to develop uh, solutions for controlling the state's uh, invasive weed programs uh, through classical biological control and integrated pest management. She is currently working to control the Brazilian pepper tree and also our uh, air potato uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, if she's successful, and I'm hoping she will be on these projects, It'll save millions of dollars annually because of the reduced need for expensive mechanical and chemical control methods. Uh, we had some control people out doing some of the work today, and I think they had seven people there to do a little bit of work on an acre of land. So it was costing the county quite a little bit. Uh, we appreciate uh, the insect that you see there. Isn't it a beautiful thing? And it loves to eat these air potato leaves. Uh, Carrie, you want to take over? 
Okay, okay, perfect. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to be the inaugural speaker on, on your first go with a Zoom meeting, which is something I've unfortunately gotten very used to over the past six months. But so tonight I'm going to talk to you about biological control of invasive plants in Florida. So uh, Dr. Baker, Baker talked a little bit about air potato and the work we've done out there. Um, but Dr. Baker said my lab is in the neighboring county in St. Lucie County, which is true, but um, I, I actually own a home not far from the Audubon Society of Pelican Island. So I could literally walk there from my house. So I'm so much closer than the next county down. So um, we're gonna talk a lot about invasive plants. So invasive plants, anybody that lives in Florida is, very familiar with invasive plants. They are literally everywhere. So here are some of the, the big ones in, in Florida. So we've got the aquatic. This is water hyacinth. This is melaleuca here. This is actually not air potato. It is kudzu, which grows actually a little bit faster than air potato does. So um, we don't have that one in South Florida, which thank goodness we've got everything else. Uh, this is Ligodium, a climbing, a climbing vine from Asia and Australia. And this one is spotted knapweed, which doesn't occur in Florida, but I like to put it in there. That's what I studied when I got my, my uh, graduate degrees. So invasive plants have to be two things. Invasive plants have to be exotic. Native plants cannot be invasive. Native plants, if they're out of control, are weeds. So invasive means they're exotic, and they also have to cause some type of harm. So invasive plants can cause all sorts of harm. They can cause environmental harm, so they can crowd out and now compete native vegetation. So here's our um, Lycodium here again. When you start to crowd out and now compete native vegetation, you start to reduce forage and habitat for native fauna. Now, Dr. Nita Baker was talking a lot about plants and how you need plants to have the birds, right? So that's what happens. You start to crowd out and reduce this forage and habitat for our native birds. You can also alter fire regimes, alter water flows. A climbing vine like this can pull fires into the tree canopy and this can be really detrimental to, to our trees. You can also threaten commercial, agricultural, and recreational activities. So here's our water hyacinth again. Water hyacinth produces this interconnected mat that ships can't even get through. And so you're definitely not taking a ship through this lake or river, and you're definitely not going to ski or fish here. You might be able to fish on the outskirts, but um, the one in the bottom, right, that is tropical soda apple. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So this is a, um, a weed in on cattle ranches and is detrimental to a cattle ranch. So it can definitely cause harm to agricultural and commercial activities. You can also cause harm to human or animal health. So a lot of our invasives can be toxic to livestock. They can be toxic to pets. They can be toxic to people. Um, if you eat them, sometimes they can cause dermatitis. This is a rash actually from, that somebody got from Brazilian pepper. So those are the types of harm that these plants can, can cause. So they have to be exotic and they have to cause harm. Well, in Florida, we have a little over 4,700 plant species in the state. And about a third of them are exotic. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean all 1,485 exotics are bad. We have a lot of exotics here that are perfectly, quote unquote, well behaved. But a lot of them are not so well behaved. So this is the Florida Exotic, Exotic Pest Plant Council's list of invasive species. It's now not Flepsy, it's now Fisk for in Florida Invasive Species Council, but that's a fairly new name change. So they break these down into category one and category two plants. I know you can't read that, you are totally not expected to be able to read that. Just to show you the number that we have here in the state. They define category one as an invasive exotics that are altering native plant communities by displacing native species, by changing community structures or interfering with ecological functions. So these are the worst of the worst 
Then we have category two, that invasive exotics that have increased in abundance or frequency, but have not yet altered Florida plant communities. So these are, these are kind of in the batter's box, right, to be category one plants. So out of category one plants, we have 81 species. So this is the worst of the worst. And category two, we have 85 plant species. So we do have our fair share of bad invasives in, in the state of Florida, which is not news to probably anybody on this call. Well, how do we control them? We know that they're bad. We know that they, they uh, do all sorts of harm to us, to the environment, to commercial activities. Well, there's a couple different ways. So there's cultural control, mechanical controls, biological controls that I'll talk about a lot, and everybody knows about chemical controls. Well, first we have mechanical control. So mechanical control is the physical disruption or removing of a plant species. So you have a couple of examples here. So you have cutting or mowing, also cut things down with chainsaws, burning, harvesting. Uh, these work great on small areas. So if you've got, you know, um, an acre or two or even a little bit more than that, you, you can get out there and you can harvest, you can burn, you can cut. When you're talking about the level, landscape level weeds, so like Brazilian pepper tree or air potato or tropical soda apple, it's really hard to get out there and be able to cut all of those down. It's, it's impossible. And so these work great on small areas, but when we're talking about invasives, widespread invasives, these aren't, aren't super great on large areas. And next we have chemical control. Most people are are familiar with that. This is the use of herbicides to spray and kill the weeds. Now herbicides work great. Um, they definitely kill weeds and and they're super satisfying because you can spray them and you know a few days or a few weeks later you have a bunch of dead weeds which everybody likes to see. The problem again with chemical control is that these things work very well on smaller areas, but if you have a weed like Brazilian pepper tree, there's not enough chemical or manpower out there or money to pay for either one of those to get rid of all of the, all of the plants. Also, you have to go back and revisit these things because you have seeds in the, in the seed bank that then sprout up and you have to go back and spray. And so it's just a continual process of having to get out there and spray. Then we've got biological control. So biological control is the use of a living thing, so in this case natural enemies, to reduce the density of a pest. Now biological control does not eradicate a pest. It will never eradicate a pest when you're talking about classical biological control, which is the introduction of of natural enemies from someplace else. So all it is going to do is going to reduce the density of of the pest to a more tolerable level. Here is a pond in Australia that's covered with salvinia. You can't really tell it's a pond, but it is. This is before the addition of biological control. Uh, they introduced a tiny little weevil to this uh, pond, and this is what the pond looked like three years later. So this is a pretty spectacular result. You don't always get the spectacular of results from biological control, but as you can tell, this, this worked rather well. And this is just biological control. There was no other types of weed control use in this system. Well, the theory behind biological control works on what's known as the enemy release hypothesis. So in the native range, say Brazilian pepper tree is native to Brazil. In Brazil, Brazilian pepper tree has all of these co-evolved natural enemies. So uh, fungi and arthropods that feed on this plant. Well, so what, this, what happens is that Brazilian pepper tree in Brazil has to defend itself against these natural enemies. And that comes at a cost, right? That uses resources to be able to defend against these natural enemies. And plants defend themselves in all sorts of ways. They defend themselves with tough leaves or thorns or hairs. Sometimes chemical warfare, they have you know chemicals that they produce to make um, their leaves distasteful. But all of this uses resources. Well, when these plant species are brought into new areas, they're usually not brought with these natural enemies with them. It's just brought the plant species. And so what this does is it frees up all of these resources so that the, 
the plant can now grow faster, it can produce more fruit, and it can outcompete our native plants that are over here on the left hand side. So our native plants are having to defend against themselves or defend against these natural enemies and these invasive plants don't have to do that. And so they're just growing like crazy. So what classical biological control does is that they go back to the native range to find these herbivores and upon testing them and making sure they're safe, we reunite them with their with their invasive plant that's over here. And so what this does is this kind of reinstates that natural balance. So it puts that plant a little bit more in check, right? So that they have to defend themselves and that uh, gives our native species a little bit more of a leg up. So biological control is safe. Um, because it's host specific and we'll talk a little bit about why we can say that. There's a high return on investment because the insects are self-perpetuating, which means that they will make more insects on their own. Insects are mobile and so they're going to spread into new areas on, on their own. And so this high return on investment comes from once we have an insect established on the landscape, it does all the work for us. It moves into new areas where the weed is, it makes more insects, so we don't have to do it anymore, and we can move on to another one of those 166 plant species that are invasive in Florida. It's also environmentally friendly because it's so specific and, so, and it's safe, because oftentimes we can reduce pesticide use when we have a, a good biological control agent out there, and Dr. Baker touched on that a little bit uh, during the meeting. Now there are negatives, uh, there are negatives to all of the weed control methods. The negatives for biological control is that there's a high upfront cost. We have to do a lot of research to make sure that these things are safe. We have to be able to demonstrate that these things are safe to the federal government and to the general public. And so that takes time and costs a lot of money. I have to have a special lab. I can't just do this like in, you know, in a in my home office or anything. We have to have a special lab that's designed to keep these insects in until we know they're safe. It's slow, both in the development of a program, so testing these insects, and once they're out on the landscape. Uh, it's, it can often take years, you know, four, five, six years in order to be able to see actual impact that these insects have once they're out of the lab. Before, classical biological control will not eradicate a pest, it's just going to reduce the density. And sometimes it doesn't always stick. Sometimes there are uh, things in the new environment like predators or parasitoids that um, don't allow our biological control insects to get to a high enough level to actually cause any damage. And we do our best to try to make sure that they are going to stick, but sometimes they, they just don't. So the process of biological control, as I said before, we have to go over to where our plants come from, right? These are exotic plant species, and in order to find their co-evolved natural enemies, we have to go to where they're native. So we go to where, to where they're native. This is always in collaboration with um, scientists in the native range. We uh, look for species that are feeding on the target and just as important as feeding on the target, feeding, not feeding on other plants, right? We want insects that are host specific to, to just our weed. Like I said, we work with overseas collaborators. We have to be able to determine the identification of these insects, get background info and start doing initial testing. All of this stuff is much easier done in the native range because you don't have to have all the permits, these ladies and guys know where these plants are, the, the process of getting the paperwork that we need, it, it just makes it a whole lot easier working with people overseas. Once we have determined insects that we want to pursue um, further, we think that they might be good, uh, they might be good to use here. Uh, we bring them into, this is my lab in Fort Pierce, into our quarantine lab. Like I said before, this is um, a specialized lab that's designed to keep things in uh, so that we don't have any unfortunate accidents and having releasing something that's going to cause problems. 
So in order to make sure that these plants are safe to release in the environment, we do what's called centrifugal phylogenetic testing. Now this is a, just a big 75 cent science word for um, we're going to test the things that it's closely related to. So here you have Brazilian pepper tree in the middle. We're of course going to test on Brazilian pepper tree because we want to know that it feeds on the target. And then we test things in um, the same genus. So these are congeners. So these are very closely related plants. So if we're thinking about like a family, this, if you're the target weed, th these are your brothers and sisters, right? So these are um, things that are closely related to the plant. And we test all of these. So all of the things in the same genus that occur in North America, right? Because insects don't care about geopolitical boundaries. And so we have to test everything in that genus in North of America because it could easily, those insects could easily come from Florida and go to Mexico. So we test all of them because if these insects are going to feed on anything else, they're going to feed on one of these first because they're the most alike as our plant species. They have very similar leaves, they have very similar tastes, they have very similar chemicals. Then we move out. So we test in things in other genera and in the same tribe. So these are like cousins, right? And so we test all of these because the, the chances that the insect is gonna feed on these are still pretty high. So we test all of these. Then we go out even further, other tribes in the same family. So these are like second cousins. And we test, um, we test all of these or a majority of these. Um, and then you get even further out, and this is where you start picking up plants of economic or aesthetic value. So these are um, these are things like um, like citrus or wheat or um, threatened and endangered plants. So the risk is not. I mean. The chances that these insects are gonna feed on something in this level are pretty low if they haven't fed on things down here, but the damage would be great if that happened. And so we test a lot of those as well. So by the time we get out here, we've already tested all of these in these inner circles. And if you're not feeding on anything in these inner circles, these are pretty safe, but we usually do them anyway. Well, I mean, we, do, we have to do them anyways. And so by the time we get done here, we can tell you what this insect can and cannot feed on. But while in quarantine, we have to do other things, right? Oftentimes these insects that we bring in are not things that are known to science beforehand. Uh, there are approximately 5 million species of insects in the world and we're not even halfway there on identifying all of them. The things that we have identified Currently, as insects are, are things that are problematic, so they eat our crops, or they uh, spread diseases in people, or that are pretty, right? Like butterflies and, and things like that. People see them and they're big and they're charismatic, and so people have described those. But sometimes these insects aren't pests, and so they're not really causing a problem, and so they just haven't been described yet. So we have to do all of these other things in quarantine because we basically don't know anything about these insects. And so we have to do things like basic biology studies, looking at how long these insects have, uh, take to develop, how many eggs are laid per the female, where and when the eggs are laid, what they need to make sure they lay eggs because we want them to have lots and lots of insect babies. And then we have to do impact studies because we do all of these studies and then when we release these insects we know they're going to be safe but there's still risk involved you are still introducing a non-native species into a new area and so in order to be able to take on that risk even that minuscule amount of risk we have to know that there's an impact to the to the invasive plant right so this is the benefit part of that risk benefit equation so here over on the right, that's a water hyacinth that had no insects. And then over here on the left is one that did. So that was pretty, that insect was pretty impactful. We've had a lot of biological control successes in Florida since we started doing it. Uh, we've been doing biological control in, in Florida for more than 100 years and in the United States for almost 120 years. 
Um, if we were in person, I would have brought a stack of these of these um, pamphlets for you so that you could read about it. But if you actually hold your phone up, turn on your camera and just hold that up on that QR code over here on the left, it will actually take you to the website where you can click and you can get an electronic version of this of this pamphlet that we did. Lots of pretty pictures, lots of good stories about the uh, the insect and the biological control. So I'm going to tell you a couple stories about uh, biocontrol successes in Florida. So the first one is alligator weed. So this is a uh, a weed that occurs. It's semi-aquatic, so it can it can occur in aquatic situations and on the banks of streams and ponds. It's native to South America because remember it's exotic. It was introduced into Florida in the early 1900s, and in 1963. 97,000 acres of the U.S. were infested with this plant. We do have a biological control agent for it. So this is the alligator weed flea beetle. It was established in the U.S. in 1965. So I said we've been doing this for a long time. The larvae are the most damaging. So you can see the larvae here. Uh, here is the attractive beetle, the adult. Um, so uh, these guys chew the epidermis of the stalks and can actually kill the plants. So in 1981, so almost two full decades after uh, releasing, less than a thousand acres of the U.S. were infested with this plant. So this is pretty spectacular results. Uh, these beetles are actually capable of reducing plant populations in about three months. So they're actually uh, pretty quick once they get released. These guys are extremely effective in coastal regions of the southeastern U.S. So most people who have lived in Florida, you know, not since the 1960s, probably don't even realize what alligator weed is, right? Everybody in Florida knows what Brazilian pepper tree is, alligator weed, they're like, oh, never, never heard of it. You thank these insects. Um, so it's extremely effective in coastal regions in the southeastern U.S., but they don't like cold, and so um, they don't survive winter te temps temperatures very well. And so we have really good control here in Peninsula, Florida, but in some other places off of the coast in the southeast and even the north, they don't get very good control. So what they're doing now is they're doing augmentative releases. And so the Army Corps of Engineers does this where they'll actually ship these beetles into different areas so they can release, get some good suppression during the summer and then do it again in the next summer because they're not gonna survive the winter. Our next is tropical soda apple. We talked a little bit about that in the introduction. This is also native to South America. It was first reported in Florida in 1988. Some of you all might know this plant. It is still around. This plant has some nasty thorns. There's thorns on the stem, there's thorns on the top of the leaf, thorns on the bottom of the leaf. You definitely don't want to grab this plant. Um, it is definitely not friendly. But it was first reported in Florida in 1988 and spread into most of the southeast. It infested about 400,000 hectares across 11 states, so it was extremely problematic. It was especially problematic for cattle ranchers. Uh, it was really bad in cattle ranches. Cows won't eat the leaves and won't eat the plant because of all those thorns, but they love to eat the fruit. When a cow eats a bunch of salinaceous fruit and they defecate, you get a bunch of tropical soda apple popping up in this nice moisture and nutrient rich cow patty, right? So just spread it everywhere. This is also a solanaceous plant, so it's a reservoir for plant path pathogens for solanaceous crops like, like eggplants and tomatoes, all the delicious things we like to eat, so it was bad news. It cost about six and a half to sixteen million dollars in control costs annually in Florida, so it was a major, major problem in the state. This is Gradiana boliviana, or the tropical soda apple beetle. This cute little um, tortoise beetle. You actually flip them over, it's almost translucent. You can almost see the internal organs. It's, these guys are so neat. Uh, but it was first released in 2003, and it can reduce the density of tropical soda apple by 90%. This was an, an amazing biological control agent. And it reduced fruit production by up to 94%, which is where you get that spread, right? Especially with the cattle. But like our alligator weed flea beetle, 
there's issues getting it established in areas with colder winters. So my postdoc is actually working on a project right now looking at how we can increase the ability of these beetles to overwinter in colder winters. Um, cattle ranchers in the panhandle still have a major problem with, with these plants. And so we're trying to figure out a way to be able to help them out by getting these things to survive the winter. Air potato, Dr. B Baker talked about air potato. Any of you guys been to the Pelican Island Audubon house? You've seen air potato, you definitely have it there. This is native to tropical Asia and Africa. It was introduced as 1905 as a potential horticultural crop. Um, the person that brought it in thought it might be good to be used as food. Found out pretty soon after that, don't eat it, it's, it's poison. <laughs> uh, so uh, definitely not use as a food crop. It does displace natives. It grows eight inches, can grow up to eight inches in a single day and can therefore cover your trees and everything around it. The joke is if you stand still too long, it might actually grow over you. It of course disrupts ecosystem functions because of this fast growth. Dr. Baker also talked about this super charismatic beetle, the air potato leaf beetle. So here is our adult. Here's big, red, charismatic. If we were in person, I would have brought some. They squeak. They're, um, they're great. I just love, love these little guys. Um, the larvae over here, not as charismatic. They're kind of slimy, but super damaging. So both the adults and the larvae feed on the plants, and they do an amazing job of it. They skeletonize the leaves. You can kind of see um, here, this, they're just getting started. Anybody who has air potato, um, they've seen this beetle damage and it can be pretty impressive. But it was first released in 2012, so actually not that long ago. And they're super damaging. So this, these are some pictures from my colleague, Min Ryamaji from the USDA ARS Invasive Plant Research Lab down in Fort Lauderdale. So this is, one of his research plots in June of 2012, so you can see air potatoes just climbing all over these trees, it's everywhere. It's all air potato. This is before the release of the beetle. This is a little over a year later. So this is August, 2013. You can still see a little bit of air potato, but not nearly as much as before. And this is August, 2014. So a little over two years after the release. There's still air potato here, but not nearly as much. And so this is just air potato beetles. They, they did a spectacular job. Uh, the vine, or, so the beetles will actually reduce vine coverage, as you can tell from these pictures, but they also reduce um, bulbal production. So the bulbals are the, how it gets their name, they're the air potatoes, right? They grow up in, in between the leaves, and fall in the in the winter and then sprout new vines in the in the spring. There is a new beetle, so Liliocerus aegina. It doesn't have a common name yet. Uh, these guys actually eat those bulbils. So here's a bulbil here. The female will um, chew a little hole, lay some eggs, the eggs hatch, and the larvae eat the inside of the bulbil. This is a bulbil that has been broken up um, after the larvae have been feeding inside, this bubble is definitely not sprouting. And so we're hoping that this is going to be kind of the, the one-two punch on air potato since we still do get these, um, these bulbal production just less. We're hoping this is going to knock it back and we're not going to have problems with air potato anymore. But um, these got recommended for release in 2018, so we're probably a year, year and a half away from actually being able to release them. We're going through, or um, Dr. Dre is going through the process of getting them approved right now. Okay, future successes. So these are some of the things that we've gotten started um, that we're really hoping are going to be in the brochure in five or six years. So this is Brazilian pepper tree. I've talked about it a lot. It's kind of my baby right now. It's my biggest, my, by far my biggest project right now. The Brazilian pepper tree is from Brazil. So in this blue area right here, so it's coastal Brazil. It is a perennial tree that occurs in coastal and open areas. This is, this is true in Florida. It's also true in Brazil. It's a member of the Anacardia ACE. If any of you all know anything about plants, this is the plant family of all the itchy, scratchy things. So this is poison ivy, poison oak, mangoes, cashews, things that people are allergic to. 
And so a lot of people can be very sensitive to Brazilian pepper tree. You saw a picture of a rash earlier in the presentation. Brazilian pepper tree was introduced into Florida as an ornamental because somebody thought it was pretty in the late 1800s. We have nearly 280,000 hectares infested, so all these green counties are infested in Florida, so pretty much has swallowed all of peninsular Florida. It inv invades both disturbed and natural sites, can displace native vegetation. Well, it was introduced into Florida twice, once into Miami and once into Punta Gorda. And the physician who introduced it into Punta Gorda is actually on the record saying that it's so beautiful, it ought to be in every garden in Florida. Um, I, I'm always really careful what I say and for many reasons, but one of the reasons is because I don't want to go down as 100 years from now, somebody saying, Dr. Carrie Mentier said this. Wow, <laughs> because I, re I really think that's Dr. Geosun is probably not very happy. That's what he's known for, is introducing Brazilian pepper tree. Well, what makes Brazilian pepper tree so ag aggressive? Well, it's tolerant to almost everything. It's tolerant to shade, fire, drought, uh, salinity. It can, it can grow almost anywhere. Uh, it's allelopathic, which basically means it secretes chemicals into the um, soil to inhibit the growth and germination of, of surrounding plant species, so plant chemical war warfare. There's hybrid, hybrid vigor. I said it got introduced into Miami and Punta Gorda. So these biotypes of the plant don't occur very closely together in Brazil. Now they occur very close together. They've actually hybridized and made a plant that grows faster and produces more berries than the plants that were brought in. So we're dealing with kind of a super weed. So we've got massive plant growth and fruit production. All of you all have seen it. You're about to see the berries here in a couple weeks because we're, we're about to start flowering now. Um, you'll see that. And the birds, robins especially love these, um, love these berries. They feed on these berries and of course carry them all over the state and outside of the state. So um, birds love it, but they do spread it everywhere. State and federal agencies spend about two and a half million dollars a year controlling this on publicly held conservation lands. So this does not include any private lands. These are just publicly held conservation lands. So the, that, that figure is much, much higher than two and a half million. What the good news is, is that we have biological control agents. So this is Pseudophilothrips ichini, which is the Brazilian pepper tree thrips, and Calophylla latiforceps, which is the yellow Brazilian pepper tree leaf dollar that, that we've been working on. So these are the thrips. Um, these are not as charismatic as that beautiful red beetle, but uh, we like them. They're very damaging. So here, here's the adult right here. It, the adults lay eggs on the new growing stems of Brazilian pepper tree. The eggs hatch. Here are two larval stages, these yellow and orange stages here. Also very damaging, feeding on those growing tips. The adults feed on the growing tips as well. And then you have three pupal stages that pupate in the soil and sometimes they actually move. They can be crawling around on the plant a little bit, but they don't feed. We tested these, of course, to make sure that they were safe to release. They were tested on 127 different plant taxa. Uh, so this is for, across 45 families and 33 orders. So very extensive testing. This is very broad testing. And we found that the thrips will only feed and reproduce over generations on Brazilian pepper tree and China mole, which is Peruvian pepper tree and on Peruvian pepper tree, which doesn't occur in Florida um, and is actually an invasive, it doesn't reproduce very well. So we'll put 20 thrips on the plant and you get two thrips out at the end. And so it's not a very good host, but they can feed on that, but it's invasive. And so that's, that's okay. What we found is that these thrips are very, very impactful. So here, so this is percentage of dry stems over here. Our white bars are controlled, so that means no insects. These gray bars are with insects. And so you can see percentage of dry stems. 
after her delivery. So this is, we put thrips on for 30 days and then removed them and then counted the dry stems. So you have a lot more dried stems directly after her delivery. Two and a half months after recovery, so this is two and a half months after the thrips have been removed, you can see there's still a lot of dried stems here on the, on the insect uh, treated plants. And so these, these insects are both damaging and the plants don't really recover very well. So this is, this is good, good news. So this is a plant, it's two and a half months after recovery. You have fewer leaves and definitely a lower growth rate on this. So the thrips verdict, they're host specific. They only will feed and reproduce on resilient pepper tree. They're very damaging and they're proof for release. And so we have actually been releasing these since um, the last summer. And um, I should have updated this. I updated all my data today, but we have over 170,000 released across the state at this point. Uh, so what we're doing right now is we are testing the best release methods and to, because we have to be able to get this right, right? We want to be able to get these strips out and get them established. But we, we have seen some damage here in the field. So this is in the field. This is in the field. This is the kind of damage that you'll see. So this is those growing tips that are, are definitely being fed upon and, and dying. But what we have found is that if you do a single release, with uh, just the thrips, no cages or anything, you have to have pretty high numbers. I mean, you have to have at least, you have to have more than 300. So, um, and they're, they're difficult to find. Fire ants, spiders, other ants love to feed on these thrips. And so we're now starting to do these cage releases, as you can see here, to kind of protect those thrips from those, those predators. And so we're testing those right now to see how well that's working. Hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to offer these uh, thrips to the public, kind of like we did the Brazilian, or the um, air potato beetles, but we're not quite there yet. So maybe next summer, we'll be able to do that. But we just had to figure out how to get them established. The other insect is this leaf gobbler. So uh, these cute, small, little yellow things, these are about a millimeter or two long, very, very small. They're from northeastern Brazil here in Salvador or in Bahia. They produce uh, leaf galls, which you can see here, so pit galls. These guys mate and then they lay eggs. You can see this female here laying an egg on the margins of the leaves. See these small eggs here. Once the eggs hatch, the crawler crawls to the top of the leaf surface and starts feeding. So they that's what they do the entire time they're immature. They pick a spot on the leaf, they stick their mouth parts in and all they do is feed. And so this is, uh, this is a fifth instar. So this is getting ready to emerge. So, um, but they act as a nutrient sink to the plant because they're just sitting there feeding and the plant is setting resources to kind of nurture this gall that's being formed and it reduces the growth rate of the plant. So then they emerge as adults and the cycle starts over again. It takes about 40 to 45 days. We host range tested these, of course, and what we found is that egg laying occurs on species in Anacardiaceae. So this is in the same family, right? So here is, this is Brazilian pepper tree. This is Shinus moly, Peruvian pepper tree. We talked about that earlier. It's the most closely related plant. Here's another Shinus plant, so another congener. And then a couple other plant species here that had much fewer eggs laid on them. You see, we did get some egg laying on, on these, these congeners right here. So that could be worrisome. I mean, you're getting 125 eggs laid on a plant. That could be worrisome until we actually followed the eggs and noticed that the eggs on these non-target plants either dried and didn't hatch at all. And if they did hatch, the crawlers crawled to the surface of the leaf and then died. So this is Peruvian pepper tree here after 30 days. And these gulls you see here are dead. They, they definitely did not establish, they did not emerge. So it's not, not a good host. There was no damage done. Uh, no measurable damage done to, to these plants. This is pistachio, same thing. So this is after 16 days, these insects are dead. No damage to this plant. And this is what they look like after 30 days on Brazilian pepper tree. So these big, fat, happy gulls and emerge as adults. So these 
insects will only feed and reproduce on Brazilian pepper tree. Nothing else, we got a single insect on, so super host specific. They also are very damaging. And when you get high infestations, you can see here, you get yellowing of leaves, you get um, deformed leaves, and you actually get leaf dropped in severe infestations. And so leaves are, of course, the powerhouse of the plant. And so if you're going to drop your leaves, you're actually going to reduce your growth rate. But what we found is these are extremely host specific. They are damaging and they are approved for release. However, these guys are very difficult to ma maintain a colony. And so we lost our colony probably back um, in January. And so no big deal, we'll just go back down to Brazil, collect them again, and, and then get them ready to release. And then COVID happened. And so um, we definitely can't get to Brazil. If we get a vaccine and we can get down to Brazil this winter, that will be great. If not, it could be delayed over a year, but we are working and trying our hardest to be able to get these insects get them back in the lab so that we can get them out on the landscape. I know I've told you about a whole lot of, um, of weed biological control programs and things. I, I don't do any of this myself. Uh, and I did, definitely had some collaborators listed on, as a, on my title slide, but they're definitely not all the people I've worked with. I try to have everything cited, but here are some of my collaborators, funding agencies, overseas collaborators could not do this without every single one of these people and probably 20 more people that I've forgotten to put on here. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I know we're going to have some, some chats. We've got 19 coming through already. Um, my lab is also on Twitter and Facebook. If you would like to follow us there, if you're interested in knowing when we're going to be able to get these thrips out to the general public, that's going to be the first place you're going to see it. And so um, follow us on social media. You might, we, we like to always put something fun about insects up there. And so it's, it's a good follow. Do you think we will just have to quote, get used to any category one invasives, or do you think there will be scientific and safe ideas coming in the future? Well, so, um, yeah, I, that's an excellent question. Um, the category ones are of course the ones that are causing the most damage. And so those are the ones that we are most focused on trying to find a solution. And so uh, there's very few labs in Florida doing biological control. I sound like a swole brat when I say that because um, in many other states there are no labs looking at biological control and we have three. <laughs> so, um, but we are definitely trying to tackle um, tackle these guys. Biological control, in my opinion, is the, the most effective way to control landscape level weeds, but it, it takes a long time to get out there. So we are definitely working on it. And so we're gonna tackle, of course, the most damaging first to try to uh, get those out. But yeah, we're, we're always looking for new ideas, trying new things to try to get rid of these things. These things are here to stay. I mean, we're never going to have a landscape free of Brazilian pepper tree. We're never gonna be free of a landscape free of air potato. But what we want to do is to reduce their density so they're not as problematic, so they're more tolerable. Are you having any problem getting funding for this? Uh, it really depends on on the the weeds so we're um we're very well funded um the state actually funds a majority of of my lab um but i mean we do have other things fwc of course is very very um supportive of of this work and so yeah we 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 have it much better than other states do which is why we have so many labs because invasive species are such a problem in the state well, if you've been around, uh, Brazilian pepper is all over our, our county and mm -hmm. along the roadsides. Uh, it, 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 uh, native plants really can't stand up against it. And, yeah. uh, and, and of course, the other one, the air potato, too, are, are two the, the worst ones, I think, we got. Yeah, it's, um, the, they're, they're definitely bad. And we're working, yeah, we're working as, as fast as we can. Um, we've got... I have eight people on my crew, and so, um, you know, we're doing as much as eight people can do. 
do you uh, need the volunteers help or yeah we are always um happy to have volunteers come and assist us in the field and so you can email me if you're interested in that type of opportunity you know uh, we work with um you all and um people in the um in the oslo area to to pick up invasive plants air potato bubbles and things all the time we were giving you a lot of bubbles <laughs> yes you were yes you were we definitely appreciated it and now we're I mean, we grow a little bit of air potato because we've got those beetles. We don't release them anymore, but we have them for like outreach events and for um, experiments and things. We had our, our after school kids, the fifth graders coming and having contests and they really loved it going up nice. there. The biggest <laughs> one, the smallest one, the most and things like that. Very cool. Thank you very much for uh, making your presentation today.